So, episode three of Strange and World is out. And just like last week's episode focused on Uhura, this week's episode focuses on number one, played by Rebecca Romaine. And the basic premise of the episode is Enterprise is surveying a planet called Hetemet 9, I think. Uh, they're researching the disappearance of a species called the Illyrians. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the Illyrians were a species in Enterprise. I don't remember them being uh, genetically engineered, but that's a story from another day. <laughs> uh, but they're researching on the surface, doing some scouting, and they're sent back to the Enterprise because of these ion storms that are frequently sweeping the planet. Uh, and Pike and Spock get stuck on the planet because of the ion storm, the transporter can't lock on. Number one's left in charge of the Enterprise. A series of disastrous things ensue, and a virus sweeps across the ship that attracts everybody to light. Everybody has to, has to be in contact with light all the time. But number one is immune for a reason that we don't yet know. Uh, but it's sort of teased throughout the episode what it might be, and through the through that teasing, Khan Union Singh is mentioned. The Illyrians, the species, were devoted to genetic engineering, which of course was frowned upon by the Federation, so they were not allowed to join the Federation. But Spock discovers when reading their sort of their scrolls uh, that they were actually the last surviving Illyrians turned their back on genetic engineering because they want to join the Federation so badly. So I've got to talk about Hammer who is an absolute highlight of this episode. He is so flipping funny. Every single line of his was great. He's such a smart ass. I absolutely love it. He's got great interactions with all the crew, especially number one. They have a great rapport uh, back and forth. Uh, it was fantastic. And I specifically loved just his mannerisms, just everything about him. The fact that he's an ENR is, is just incredible already and, and, the, and that he's a great character. He's icing on the cake. You know, he comes in to inspect, uh, you know, he makes a joke about, <laughs> about how he loves running diagnostics in the middle of the night for fun. <laughs> and he comes in to inspect Mbanga's medical transporter, do a diagnostic on it. And then we get a little tease that Mbanga's up to something. Uh, we're not really sure what it is then that he, he sort of manipulates Hammer to leave and not investigate. So that, that's our little, little tease about what Mbanga's really up to. So shortly after uh, number one and the away team return to Enterprise. They start to show these weird symptoms about this attraction to light that I've already mentioned. But number one, when she's in your quarters, sort of feels the attraction, but then she has she she fights off the virus and she starts glowing and there's this really weird thing going on. We don't really understand what we're seeing. Uh, and then she goes to sick bay and discusses with Mbenga and Benga says, you know, you you your your body has fought this off. You have you're immune somehow, uh, and that and that's sort of our hint that there's something special going on uh, with number one. I've already mentioned that they discussed Khan uh, with Lon, and that scene Lon succumbs as well, and everybody starts coming to the point where, you know, Hammer is <laughs> Hammer is trying to beam in a piece of of the core of Hedimit Nine because he wants to feel the warmth on his skin, and Lon is is overloading the warp core to feel the light and, and, and the sun and uh, the, the heat. And number one is the only one that is able to stop this even in Benga succumbs. So they learn that darkness actually prevents the transmission of the virus uh, because Uhura is in her room with her, with her you know, bunk buddies uh, and doesn't succumb, but they do. So they realize the darkness stops it. So they shut off all the power in the Enterprise and, and they sedate all the people that have, that, have, have, that have acquired the virus, which does solve the issue. However, Laan wakes up and that's when she tries, tries to overload the warp core and things kick off. She's the last one that they have to stop. And once they do, everything goes, goes through with, with, with figuring out uh, how, to, how to solve the problem and how to, how to combat the, back, the virus. So back on the surface, Pike and Spock see what they think are ghosts coming out of the Iron Storm. Uh, and then a little bit later on, the window blows in and the ghosts show up and actually help them and, and save them from the storm by covering them in like a sort of dome. Uh, and we find out later that these ghosts are actually the colonists who had succumbed to the virus, the light attraction virus, and had gone into the ion storms chasing the lightning. And there spikes something about their molecules bonding with the ionization and they became ghosts essentially. And the only reason that this could have happened was because they were reversing their genetic engineering because they wanted to become a fit part of the Federation so badly. So it's a sort of you know, they were so determined to, to become part of the Federation that it ended up being their downfall. And we get the big reveal 
uh, that number one isn't actually human. Number one is an Illyrian, so she is genetically engineered. That's the whole big twist of this episode, which is totally fine. I mean, it doesn't break canon or anything, and I, I think it's great. Um, so now we have two genetically engineered characters on the show, <laughs> uh, which is a big point of contention between, you know, Lon and number one are our close friends, but Lon never knew that number one was genetically engineered. So uh, when number one has to fight Lon uh, in the warp reactor, Lon sort of, sort of, breaks and you know, says that she sort of betrayed their friendship and they have a little sit down at the end of the episode discussing it uh, in which all is forgiven pretty much but now Lon says that she was always tormented as a kid saying you know, you're an augment, you're an augment which they, she never actually says straight out that she is but she is because she's, she's stronger in the first episode we saw that she was taking the genome therapy, genome reconstruction with ease and, and not feeling the pain. Um, but her and number one, are, uh, they mend their friendship, and we leave the episode with number one trying to resign her commission to Pike. And Pike says, absolutely no way. You know, if there's one thing I've learned being on the surface of that the planet was that the Illyrians are extremely misunderstood. Uh, I welcome Starfleet to contest my judgment on this in any way because this is something. And this sort of bigotries is a theme of the whole episode, and Benga mentions it uh, when he before he's sedated how, you know, so many instances in history, bigotries have kept you from healing each other, and this is this is in a way another instance of that. Uh, but we move beyond it as we always do, as we always should. So number one gives a log entry uh, at the end of the episode, basically saying that she has finally come out, she's finally admitted to who she really is, yet she still feels she doesn't quite feel right, and she wishes that she could just be comfortable with who she is uh, as an Illyrian but she's still dealing with, with being an augmented and being sort of public knowledge now. So we'll see how in the future episodes, how that plays in, I'm sure will be a big part of it. And we learned that the reason the, the virus was able to get through the biofilters on the transporter was because Dr. Mbanga had not allowed his medical transporter to be updated in space dock. So we, we got hinted at this earlier on with Hammer, but now we, we learn why that was, and it's because he's actually holding his daughter in the pattern filter because his daughter has contracted this, this terminal disease that there's no cure for. Uh, and if he keeps her in the buffer and just materializes her every once in a while, he can keep her alive. So he, he beams her in every once in a while and reads her a little bedtime story, which is the ending of the episode, and it's very sad. Um, but you know, there was you maybe got the sort of vibe that Mbenga might have this sort of villainous thing going on, but that doesn't end up being the case. He ends up just, he's doing it for his daughter. It's a very sweet little moment, and a tear-jerking moment really at the very end, where he's reading this little uh, bedtime story to his daughter. I'd say this is probably the best episode yet. Uh, I really appreciate how each episode is devoted to pretty much all to one character. Last episode we got Ahura's development, which was nice, but I feel like this was a much more interesting story and with with number one and we get the big reveal that she's an Illyrian which will have huge impacts in the future whether you know the last episode with Uhura we, it didn't really end up being this huge transformative thing like it did with number one so I think just the impact of this episode alone makes it particularly great and the performances were absolutely fantastic you know I, I'm glad we got a chance for Rekko Main to shine because she did she's fantastic and she's perfect as number one uh, and, and the new character like Hammer, I just can't wait to see more of. Uh, but a lot of other characters got sort of sidelined. Ortegas, we saw her for like two seconds. And Pike and Spock, you know, the main characters were, were also sort of given a little bit of a sideline. But other than that, I mean, just a fantastic episode. I, I loved it. It was incredible. <laughs>